Good morning, Cisco cohort four. On the schedule for today, we're going to cover, oh, and this session is being recorded and it'll be posted later today on the, my uh, recorded presentations link. <clears throat> today, I'm going to cover uh, the slideshow for module 10, network management, like 75 slides there. Um, uh, on your own time, I'm asking you to uh, read the chapter nine chapter and there's about five or six videos that cover that quality of service stuff. Quality of service is our concept that uh, some stuff needs to be put up to the head of the line because it's very latency sensitive, like a voice over IP telephone call or streaming audio or video, something of that sort. Uh, there won't be any on in, in person on campus lab this Thursday morning at nine o'clock because uh, all of the computer science and IT instructors are in a district wide uh, uh, advisory faculty meeting. So I'm going to do that lab that was originally scheduled for this Thursday. I'll do it. Um, I'll cover it uh, on a week from Thursday on April the 29th. OK, I will go ahead and start uh, the slideshow. So we have a whole grab bag of topics in this particular chapter. And we're going to start off with the Cisco Discovery Protocol. So I like Cisco Discovery Protocol. For, uh, it's good for teaching and learning in the labs, because if we wire up a lab, we want to make sure all our connections are done properly. Um, and, it, and when you're using the live lab equipment, it's real easy to mix up these wires and think you're connected to R1 and you're connected to R2 and vice versa. and you carefully configure something and you figure out, well, oh, it's the wrong router and now the lab doesn't work properly. So I like to just, uh, before I start any lab, I like to go and connect all the devices together according to the wiring diagram on the front page of the lab. And then uh, give each device a host name, you know, S1 and S2 and R1 and R2 for the switches and routers. And on the switches, we don't have to do any no shutdowns because the switches are just on by default. But on any router ports that are connected to the lab topology, uh, you don't have to put an IP address on them. Just do a no shutdown on them. And after about a minute, you'll be able to do a show CDP neighbors from all those devices and, and confirm that, you know, F05 of the switch one goes to G01 of the first router, whatever that lab topology is. So it's really useful for that. And I like it. It's a data link layer technology. So proprietary layer two, that's a data link layer. You don't have to configure any. It doesn't care what's going on at layer three. You can configure IP addresses or not. It doesn't matter to Cisco Discovery Protocol. He's just using layer two. Now, you do have to have the port. You have to have a wire plugged into the port. And it has to be in a, in a you know, no, no shutdown state where it's actually running properly. So on switches on all the physical ports, the 24 ports, those are always no shutdown by default. They're just waiting for the wire to be plugged in. On routers, all the ports are shut down by default. So if you hooked up to a gigabit port on the router, you have to at least give the no shutdown command on those gigabit ports and then give a host name like R1 and R2 to the router, give a host name like S1 and S2 to the switches. And these uh, periodic advertisements are sent out about every minute or so. And it can give you a lot of useful information about uh, your neighboring devices. In a commercial environment, this is a useful way of, if you report to a job site as a consultant and they have no idea of the topology, how things are connected together and they happen to be a Cisco shop, you can use Cisco Discovery Protocol to map out the network. Because you can't fix it unless you know how it's mapped out. Cisco Discovery Protocol is on by default, it, it's on all Cisco devices, it's turned on by default. You can type show CDP, and it'll tell you that it's it's running properly. Now, sometimes in our enterprise, we've got to use Cisco Discovery Protocol. For example, with our Cisco over IP telephones, they rely upon Cisco Discovery Protocol to talk to the switch port that the voice over IP telephone happens to be plugged into and, and get his environment from the phone control. But some interfaces, like the ones going to our internet service provider, we don't want to use Cisco Discovery Protocol on there because that would allow hackers or bad guys or malicious users to use CDP to figure out what's going on, what kind of device do we got. Oh, it's that particular model. I know a vulnerability of that particular model. So you can turn off CDP on the, <clears throat> you can type, uh, you can turn on off CDP 
on individual interfaces. So it's going to be on by default on all your Intel interfaces that go to your phones and such, but to that one port that goes off to the ISP or to some untrusted network, you can just say no CDP enable. Like for example, if it's gigabit port zero zero, you would go configure terminal interface gig zero zero and then say no CDP enable. And that way CDP uh, advertisements won't be sent and received off that particular interface. Now I can turn it off. <clears throat> the default is CDP run is the default. CDP is running on all interfaces on the whole device by default on all Cisco devices. If I want to turn it off on the entire device for some reason, I can type no CDP run and that'll turn it off for every interface. I don't have to do an interface by interface basis. Then you can type to verify, you can type show CDP interface on each interface and see what's happening on each one of those interfaces. Now, Cisco Discovery Protocol is Cisco proprietary. That's only on Cisco devices. We're going to see another one in just a minute, LLDP, that's open standard. So I'm going to go to a device, and I'm going to connect. Uh, here we have R1 is connected to S1. And R1 has typed show CDB neighbors. And we can see that the local interface, this is R1's interface. R1's interface, gig001. We know it's been a, no shutdown is on there because otherwise it wouldn't be in there. And we can see uh, that our local interface on our router R1 connects to fast Ethernet port 05 of the switch S1. We can see the capabilities of the switch, that it's a switch. We can see that it's actually a 3560 switch, which is one of Cisco's switch models. So it's a great way to verify connectivity and verify the host names of the devices. And typically, if you were sent out to a uh, field location where nobody had, had any idea where everything is connected, you could, for example, connect to R1 and then Telnet to S1, which is probably the same password, and then sort of branch out through the network like that and learn the connection of all the various devices as they're connected to each other. The entry show CDP neighbor detail gives you a lot of extra information. This is what the hackers, this is what you don't want the hackers to get. You don't want them to learn exactly what model of device you have, exactly what version of the iOS it's running, et cetera, because they might say, oh, a Cisco 3560 switch with the older version of the iOS in it. I've got a good exploit to break into the vulnerability on that thing, and I can hack into a switch in that fashion. Okay, so there are some other, um, Cisco Discovery Protocol is, is it's like the iOS, it's, it's proprietary to Cisco, but there's an open standard one, which for example, Microsoft Windows uses, Link Layer Discovery Protocol. And it's, it's exactly like CDP, in the sense that Portuguese is exactly like Spanish, it just does it slightly differently. And it works with all sorts of network devices, like routers, switches, wireless access points. This is the mechanism that's, that Windows 10 uses when you look in his network neighborhood and he tells you he's connected to your home router and he has access to the internet. And some other brand of Cisco phones, uh, uh, some other brands of, of voice over IP phones, not Cisco brands, but other brands, will use, will use this as an alternative so that the phone can communicate with the switch and learn about what is configuration, what phone number and so forth is he supposed to be on that physical telephone set. Other than that, very similar to CDP, advertisements are sent about every 60 seconds back and forth. And instead of typing the command show CDP neighbor, you can type show LLDP neighbor and see the list of your name of your devices. Now this is open standard and vendors and manufacturers have their own choices of what to do. Cisco has decided that Cisco discovery protocol is enabled by default on all devices they make. Other vendors may decide to turn on link layer discovery protocol by default, or they may decide not to. It depends on the vendor, each vendor, each manufacturer. Uh, has his own choice. On Cisco devices, LLDP is not on by default, just Cisco Discovery Protocol. So if I want to turn on Link Layer Discovery Protocol at the same time, because maybe I got some mixtures of other brand devices, other vendor devices, I can just command enter the command LLDP run. If I want to disable it, which is the default on Cisco devices, no LLDP run will disable it. You can configure it on specific interfaces like you can uh, with Cisco Discovery Protocol. It's configured, the transmit and the receive though was configured separately. With Cisco Discovery Protocol, it was either you know, on or off. With Link Layer Discovery Protocol, you have to turn on the transmit and the receive functions on and off uh, separately. Then they can type show LLDP and see some details about the configuration on that particular device. 
So just like talking show CDP neighbor, I can type show LLDP neighbor, and I get, look at this, I get a chart that's very similar to what I saw with show CDP neighbor. I can see that R1s, uh, uh, this is a switch S1. He's connected to R1s uh, G001 port through his local interface, faster than at zero slash five. And we can see that switch one is connected to switch two through both their number one ethernet ports, typically on our Cisco network and Academy Labs, we always attach our switch one and switch two by pin one to pin one. Port number one to port number one, switch port number one, switch port number one. You can also get interesting, more interesting details. Uh, instead of typing show CCP neighbor detail, you can type show LLDP neighbor detail and whatever support the capabilities the vendor has built into that particular device, you can get some extra information about that device. So, so here we can see that uh, we have a Cisco switch that's actually running a version of Linux. Okay, next uh, thing in the bucket today is network time protocol. And this is important because in cybersecurity, if someone breaks into our network from some device, say he, he socially engineers some guy to click on a dubious link on an email and uses that as a vector so it get into the network. And then once he gets control of that employee's workstation, he uses that and he jumps to other workstations and servers and he's trying to you know, find the goodies like the servers with the interesting stuff in them that can hold up for ransom. So as these guys break into the system and hop around, it's important that we, uh, the log files, we're gonna track these guys by going to the log files of all the workstations and servers and routers and switches and stuff that he proceeded through, that he stair-stepped through to get to the system. And if the clocks of all these logs are not exactly in sync with each other, it's very difficult to say, well, did he go to this device first and that device second and that other device third, or was it some other order? So if we have a central master reference clock, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, that tells us the exact day, uh, minutes, seconds, and and the year, the month, day of the year, and so forth, we can use network time protocol to sync all these devices together. Now, normally most devices have a battery backup clock in them. For example, your desktop PC Windows machine has a little CMOS battery backup clock that runs even when the power is removed. And so you don't have to type in the date and time every time you start it up to tell what time it is. But we used to have to do this back in the early 80s when the IBM PC came out. It would boot up and they would ask you to type in the date and type in, type in the time. It didn't have a battery clock on it. You could buy a little extra card and plug it into it and it would provide a, a clock for you. So we need to synchronize the time across all these devices on the network because otherwise, if it's not synchronized, we can't look at the log files and figure out this cybersecurity event that occurred. You know, how did you get in around and get in and step through the system? So I can manually configure the time like this. I can, if I have a, a device like a router that has the wrong time set, or I want to force it to a certain time, um, in the lab, they're going to have you force it to a certain time. You type clock set, and he types in the time in 24-hour format, and he types in the month and the day and the year. And that'll update the time. Just like on your PC, you can go into your PC windows, and if you don't like the time that's in there, like I found, for example, if you boot, if I have a machine that I boot Linux on, and then I reboot Windows on it, well, the Linux clock seems to be on Greenwich Mean Time, Coordinated Universal Time, Zulu Time, um, and it'll be you know, five or six hours off, and I'll have to reset the clock. So you can set the clock to whatever time you need it to be. So if we've got a large network, we want to make sure that all the devices have a central reference point. We want to find some fairly expensive uh, device on our network that's going to be able to keep accurate time on it and just settle on that as the master time for our entire network. And we're going to configure that using this protocol, NTP Network Time Protocol. So we could synchronize it to a device that we have, or we could synchronize it to a device on the network. Uh, in Windows, you can go to the Windows setting where you set the date and the time, and you can tell it to go to, I think it's called time.windows.com, and you can use the clock reference that Windows refers to. And the US government also has the National Bureau of Standards, and you can use their clock to set that to the time. So this is port number 123, and there's a request for comment 1305 for it.
this works by a level of this kind of reminds me of the of the uh, DNS product DNS hierarchy. We have our DNS 13 main servers throughout the world, and then we have the .com server, and they have the .dot uh, net server, and then we go down. The ISPs got their DNS servers, and then uh, individual companies have their DNS servers. So it's a similar hierarchical system called a stratum. And the top level stratum zero is the most accurate cl clock that we can have. For example, the federal government has a cesium based clock that's very, very accurate to millions of a second. Or we could use the what time.windows.com for our desktop PCs. That would be a stratum one or a lower level. So we can have as many as uh, 15 levels in our hierarchy. We're not going to usually have that many. So stratum zero, very expensive devices, typically maintained by the federal government. A stratum one device connects back to a stratum zero device, and they're a primary network time standard, like a, a standard you could get off the internet. And stratum two and lower devices will be the devices within our company. Like we're going to have our most expensive router, and we're going to have it synchronized to the stratum one device, which is synchronized to the cesium clock that the federal government maintains, and that way. Uh, we can get a master time reference within our network. And then we're simply going to point all our other devices in our network to our little Stratum 2 server that we have, and all our log files will now be in perfect sync with each other. We can type the command show clock, and it will tell us, show, show clock detail, it'll tell us how this clock was set. So this, that command we saw before, set time, when he says time source is user configuration, that means that someone just manually set that clock. It's not synchronized to any NTP status. Once we go into that device and tell them, oh, go to the NTP server within our company network, happens to have the example IP address of 209.165.200.225, and then um, it takes a, as much as five minutes for this to take place. But after R1 syncs up, to the stratum server that's within our company, then when you go back and type show clock detail, it'll say, oh, I'm not using that time that was set by the user set clock. I'm using the network time protocol, more accurate server that was I was configured to reference to. And now the time source will be NTP instead of user configuration. Show NTP associations will show, this is our NTP server that we previously configured. And he's, he's synchronized with a reference clock, a GPS reference clock. And then show NTP status shows that our clock is synchronized. And our device within our network is a stratum 2 device. And he has an upper more, you know, the federal government GPS billion dollar satellite network. That's pretty accurate. Uh, that's our main reference point that we lock onto. So here we have set S1 wants to synchronize to the server, which has been previously configured to be, to be our, our, our master reference clock within our enterprise. Then when we type show NTP associations and show NTP clock, we can see that our devices are locked, locked to that device. And it, we can pre assured that if we have to go to the log files of this device, network device S1, that it's going to match all the log files and all the other network devices and all the other workstations and servers that have been set up to respect that particular um, reference time. Okay, simple, man simple network management protocol, not to be confused with this dyslexic neighbor, simple mail transfer protocol. I had a CCNA test one time where they said, try to confuse you between SMMP and, and uh, uh, simple mail trans S SMTP. Simple network management protocol is a protocol that allows if you've seen those commercials on television where they show a company's master network operations center and it says, we're keeping an eye on the network so your network will be, you know, reliable. And they have a bunch of workstation screens that are checking the status of everything in the network. They're using network management stuff for that. They're using simple network management protocol. So we can look at all the other devices on the network. And a company uses this scheme because he wants to, from a customer service standpoint, um, we want to be proactive rather than reactive. We don't want to find out about a network node like a router going down because all of a sudden our help desk is being flooded with calls, calls from people complaining that they cannot log into the network. Rather, we want to see when this router is starting to become stressed and before it crashes, 
and disconnects a bunch of people. We want to be able to see on our network monitoring system, oh, this, that's not in the green, that's yellow or red. Let's see what's going on with this router so we can you know, work around it or fix it or set up an alternate path. So there's three elements to simple network management protocol. There's a simple network management protocol manager. This is a workstation running a, a very complicated, sophisticated piece of software, like Hewlett Packard OpenView, or there's some open source ones as well that you don't have to pay for, that can check in with all of the devices on my network, like my routers, my switches, maybe even servers. And it can show us on the screen, everything's in the green, or we have a fault with the device. It's yellow, it's red, it's having some problem. The second element is a simple network management protocol agent. These are some lines of code that are running on our managed devices, like our routers and our switches. A simple network management protocol used to be on by default on all Cisco devices. When I first started teaching network in Academy back in 1999, 2000, it was on by default and some malicious intruders found out that because it has a default password, they were able to get into devices and they didn't have to know the enable secret password class enable secret password, and they could reconfigure the devices and mess with them. So Cisco responded by turning simple network management protocol off by default. So you need to turn it on on the device if you want it to participate. And you shouldn't turn it on unless you understand it. So the agent is the, the lines of code that run on a particular device, like say a router or switch. And the management information base is those elements of like, is, is interface up or interface down? Uh, what's in the routing table? Uh, how many errors per second have occurred on the collisions have occurred on the ethernet port. This is information that's in the management information base that the agent shares back with the manager screen at periodic intervals, maybe every 30 minutes or so. Or we even have a method where we can say, we're going to see a screen in a second called traps. I'll call them secret agents. Uh, if, if I set a router to be polled every 30 minutes by the, simple, by the manager workstation and something happens five minutes later, that I've predetermined is a is a it's a a threshold or a trap that should be sent immediately to the network managing workstation, not wait for the 30 minutes to go over. And then we can have this sort of triggered update sequence and he'll get it right away. Because we want our network management workstation people to be able to see immediately, you know, not something that's gonna happen 30 minutes down the line. Well it happened five minutes into the next scan, we should find out about it immediately. So ports 161 and 162 are used for the simple network management protocol agents, the code that are running in each managed device, like a router or a switch, to talk back and forth to that manager, which is a fairly, uh, typically a fairly high powered Windows workstation or Unix workstation that will run the, the manage, management workstation software that the people in the network operations center would be keeping their eyes on. So the manager is, this is, this is the workstation. This is the super powerful workstation. So he can send out commands to the individual devices. He can send out a get command, which is this, get me the equivalent of show IP interface brief on that router. He can also actually send out commands and change the configuration of the device. Set command, I can actually alter the configuration of one of my routers or switches. That was what the dangerous. Uh, that was the danger in the early versions of Cisco devices that had simple network management protocol was on by default. Uh, if the attacker was able to to get into this network, and the early versions had sort of a, a default fixed network uh, password, public and private password, then I could simply arbitrarily change those devices, even though I was an authorized technician or engineer. I was a bad guy trying to mess with them, mess with the that company's stuff. And then the trap is the thing I mentioned that if I say, I'm gonna send out a get request every 30 minutes to all these devices. But if something happens, you know, 35 minutes later or five minutes after my, my, my get, I'm gonna program this device that uh, if he finds some, something that exceeds a certain threshold, immediately send out the trap message back to the manager. Don't make him wait 25 minutes and get late information about something that he needs to know about right now. The agents reside on our managed devices, like routers and switches. They collect and store information, kind of like the same information you can see if you type show IP interface brief or show interfaces. And then the manager uses the uh, agent code to access information within that management information base, and he'll periodically send it to the workstation when requested, or if a uh, trap event occurs, he'll send it out right away. So get commands is just get, get information. 
a set request is to actually change configuration. That's kind of dangerous if you don't know what you're doing or you're an unauthorized user. You could mess up the configuration of a router or switch. The agent code in each controlled device. So he's got some lines of code running internally in the CPU, and then he's got the management information base. All the information is equivalent to what you would see if you type show IP interface for for show interfaces. And if the management workstation sends out get me, get a variable, I want to see what's what's show IP interface brief. Is everything up and up? Is something administratively down? Is something up and down because the wire came loose? And if the manager is authorized, they can send out a variable and actually change the configuration of the device, change the settings of that device. The trap is the feature that if I was periodically polling all the ports on this R1 interface every 30 minutes, maybe. And then five minutes after a 30 minute periodic update, something happens. I don't want to have to wait 25 minutes to find out about that. Otherwise, my help desk will be overwhelmed by people with their phones ringing, calling people, calling and complaining they can't log in. So the trap is going to be sent immediately when the triggered event occurs right back to the management workstation and it will you know, turn red, the spot on the screen will turn red or something. So that they can know right away in a more timely fashion uh, what's going on with that problem, that particular network. The original version, version one of Simple Network Management Protocol um, used public and private as the default passwords uh, back in you know, the 2000 era, the malicious intruders do this. It didn't have very high security. Uh, version two, tighten up some of the security, uh, has better messaging, but it really didn't have any good way of authenticating data or using anything other than the public and private default passwords. But in version three, they really fixed it up where they can use, you can use an arbitrary username and password. You can encrypt the data. You can hash the data to make sure that's good data. So if you're going to set up SMMP today, you should definitely be using version three. Versions one and two used a community string. And this was the, the default passwords. They were, they were literally, it was the word public and the word private. So this is very dangerous because if someone was, uh, if a bad guy would uh, say someone has set up SMMP in a company, SMMP in a company, and they weren't really that sophisticated and knowledgeable about how, about how it worked. They just turned turn it on. Then anybody that could connect to that company network and they knew that the default passwords were public and private, they could go in there and change it. The object ID is, this is the list of the stuff, the values that you would see if you type a show command of some sort on the device. So they're organized as, as um, object IDs in a sort of a hierarchical, Oh, let's look at the hierarchical thing. It's right here. Here's the hierarchical chart. So uh, <laughs> it slightly resembles the OSI seven layer reference model, but it's a hierarchical chart of organizations and departments within a company that comes up with this uh, uh, crazy dotted decimal. Well, it looks like an IP address with too many octets in it, but that's the way that the, they code the very various fields with the, the management information base. Now let's look at syslog, syslog, and let me tell you the big picture here what what syslog is good for. Have you ever had the experience of you type in something on a router like no shutdown? You're in the global configuration mode. You type no shutdown, and then you go to type something else, and a message pops up on the screen. Oh, the interface, the data link layer went up and up, and the physical layer went up, and so the device is operational now. And then it sort of vanishes off the screen as you type stuff. Stuff that appears on the screen, those status messages, once they roll off the top of the screen, they're, they're kind of lost forever. Maybe you can scroll back, maybe you can't. Gosh, the original version of Hyperterminal, which is the program that Microsoft gave with Windows 95 that's similar to TerraTerm, it had a scroll back bug. If you tried to scroll back, um, it, it was garbled. So, and if something rolls off the top of the screen or you won't even connect it to the console board or console then or, or town that it in, 
that information would never be seen. It would be off the top of the screen. Even if you plugged something in the console now, it's gone. You can't see it. You just see the new messages that appear. So syslog is a feature that we can take all these log files that are being created on the device. The device doesn't have infinite, unlimited space to store all these status messages that goes into its log. But what we can do is take any expensive desktop machine and just to put a cheap, huge hard disk drive on it and have it store all the log messages from this router and our other 10 routers and our other 11 switches on this one device. And that gives us a nice central place we can look at all the log files when some problem occurs at the network and we're trying to go through all the log files. Of course, we use network time protocol. So, so there are times and to the second match each other. And then we can maybe track the progress of an intruder as he goes through our system. So syslog uses port 514 to send messages across the network. We're going to take our syslog server, which is any expensive device, better put a big hard drive in it. Hard drives are cheap. Just put a big hard drive in it. It doesn't need to be a rack mount server. It's going to be any old junk machine that no one wants to use anymore. And you can set that up to be the syslog server. And then our various devices, like our routers and our switches, in addition to sending the messages you would normally see on the screen, but then would vanish off the top of the screen as it got scrolled away, they're also sent to the syslog server in IP packets. And the syslog server, it's very easy. It's a very easy task for that desktop PC with low resources to simply accept these packets full of lines of log data and store them on a file in the hard drive, text file on the hard drive, giving the ability to go back in the future and try to troubleshoot problems. Syslog operation sends um, system messages and what would be debug output to the local logging process, sends it to the screen. But now if we also send it to a syslog server, if we send that across a message to an external syslog server, that cheap desktop that we configured, we can look at that. We don't actually have to plug into the actual device. Now they can be sent to an internal buffer, but the internal buffer has a limited amount of space. And you can specify as an administrator how detailed, how verbose, or, or more limited are the messages that are sent to the syslog server. There's eight levels that you can specify as to how much of stuff uh, I want to get to it. So we can send it. The logging buffer is the RAM inside the router switch. Limited storage might be gone by the time we come back and look at it. Of course, everything appears on the console line or terminal line. But again, that's lost. If you weren't plugged in, you can't see it. So let's send it to a syslog server to his huge hard drive with millions and millions of lines of storage. And we can always come back later in the future and look at that, uh, uh, my little cute cylinder I've drawn there as a schematic representation of a hard disk drive. And so we can just get a huge cheap hard disk drive and save everything on that and we can and go back later and see it. Now here's our eight levels of, I'll call it verbosity or detail. Uh, the emergency level is level zero. If I don't have a lot of space to store stuff, I'll set it to level zero. And they'll tell me, oh, the system is crashing and needs to reboot. Anything else is, is, it didn't crash the system, that's, you won't see that. I can start from that level and then all the way up to warts and all. Everything, if I do level seven, well, I've got a huge disk drive. I want to see everything. I'll set it to level seven. I want to see each and every alert that appears on the screen. I want it to be mirrored, echoed, transmitted through an IP packet from this device to the syslog server so you can store it for me so I can look at it later. So we can use things like um, uh, uh, the device itself. We can, we can, for example, iOS routers. They can report things like status of the IP packets. Maybe we're running the OSPF protocol. Uh, what is the, the iOS, the system operating system? If we're running IPsec or interface information, we can report all that stuff by using our various one of our eight levels of detail. We can send that back to the device. So for example, we might use uh, the severity is uh, facil facility level severity. Maybe it's just system, you know, the lowest level, or maybe it's debug the highest level. And if you plug a port, uh, an Ethernet device into a port of a switch port of a Swiss switch, you'll get some information like this. Port channel, change state to up.
to make sure that the log files are stamped with the date and the time, which is very important. We want all our log files, each line of our log file, to have the exact date and time that occurred when that event occurred. So we can go back and tr track trouble later and correlate it between different devices. So to make sure that we take place, we're going to put in the command service timestamps log date time. And that means take the current date and time that this device knows about, which you'll have configured network time protocol. So that our one time is to the last thousandth of a second or so. And then every line that occurs in that log file will be stamped with the current date and time, the exact date and time. So this is a good practice to make sure that all your log files actually have the time in them. Now let's look at router and switch maintenance. The file systems on the router, the Cisco iOS file system, IFS, it's uh, the different file systems that are based upon this device. Now look at your desktop PC. What file systems are present on your desktop PC? Well, the hard disk drive. Uh, most of them don't have floppy disk drives anymore, but most of them will have a CD-ROM drive or a DVD-ROM drive. You might have a, a CD-ROM mounted in the CD player, and that will be that file system. You could plug in a USB attached thumb drive. That system would be in there. Maybe you might have a remotely, uh, you know, the R drive or the S drive of your network drive on there. That would be another file system. So on the Cisco devices, the file systems are, uh, this is listing the file systems on, on our router. So our important file systems are the NVRAM, which is where we start our, the startup configuration file. And then we have the disk itself, which contains the iOS. That's, this is the, typically a, a flash top drive. Flash drives are very, very slow. So what we do when we boot the device up is we load the iOS system from the flash drive into the RAM drive and it runs from RAM drive and that's very, very fast. In this particular case, this machine also has a USB device plugged into it and he's showing the fossil system based upon that. So the, the uh, one that's gonna boot up is the one with the asterisk on it. This is the one with the iOS in it. When, it, when the machine starts up, go boot that up. The strict command for this is show space flash, sometimes show space flash with a colon after it to look at a particular system like the flash memory, which contains the iOS. But they have put an alias in there. The Cisco, the old, uh, I joke that the iOS system was written by these old grizzled, sandal-footed, bearded Unix administrators that Dilbert just wants to slap in the next entry. So they made the system very Unix-like. But they did put in an alias in there, and they are, they've done this on most versions of Linux and Unix as well. You're supposed to type ls slash l on a Unix machine, a Linux machine, to see the list of files, the equivalent of dir in DOS. So the dir alias is put in most versions of Linux. They put the same thing in the Cisco iOS. Most people, their Windows users, are used to typing dir to get the list of the files in the current directory. So I can type dir instead of show flash, and it'll show me all the files and subdirectories that are present in that particular directory. If I want to look at the contents of NVRAM, well, if I was sitting in my uh, Windows-based computer and I had the C colon backslash prompt and I wanted to see the directory of the files on the uh, CD-ROM drive and it was drive D, I, I would have to type uh, in a different directory, CD backslash download. I want to see my download files. You can use the CD command, change directory command, and change it to whatever device or directory you want to see the list of. So in many of the switches, for example, you can change directory to a file name that looks like the iOS for that particular switch, and then you can see the actual individual operating files that are in that subdirectory. On the Cisco 2960 switch, which is the one that's uh, the one we use in our laboratory, um, I can I can copy files, I can upload and download files to back them up. And I can type the command exactly the same as on the router, show file systems, and see what's in the switch. Now, what's in the switch? It's a little bit more simplistic. We have our NVRAM, which contains the startup configuration. And then we have our flash memory, which contains the iOS file for the switch. That's the one that's decompressed out of slow flash memory into fast RAM memory and executed from RAM for much better system performance.
there is a feature if you want to back up a configuration of a, of a router. You can use TerraTerm or any other terminal program to do this. He gives the example here. He uses TerraTerm. He's going to go to the file menu and click log, click this entry here. Then they'll choose some location to save. Uh, essentially, it's a notepad. It's a text file, notepad file. And then you can start the capture function. And then you can type, oh, show run or show start. And everything that appears on the screen will now also be copied to this text file that you created. And when you finish doing, you'll have, usually when you type show run or show start, you have to press the space bar two or three times to get the whole thing to scroll to the screen. Then you can close the capture function in TerraTerm. And then you can check the file with a text editor, you know, like text edit or, or uh, notepad and windows and make sure that the file is okay. Of course, every time you press the space bar, there's going to be a couple of chopped lines in there that you have to edit out of the file. But this is a really cool feature because you can um, sort of gussy the file up and restore a configuration to another device. For example, if you're doing a lab in the live uh, in-person classroom and you want to just save your configuration and come back on another day and work on that part again, you can save that text file to a thumb drive or to your uh, uh, Microsoft files drive, and then you can come back later and, and put it back in after you clean it up. So to clean it up, after you take that file and you type, you press the space bar three times, if you type show run, you're going to see a bunch of more type messages, iOS trash messages. You can go back and clean that file up so it looks nice. And then here's a great trick. If I put enable and config T at the beginning of the file, and when I copy and paste it back into that device, even though it's at the regular, you know, completely unconfigured user exec mode, it will be, um, it will be sent back to there. Uh, alternative is copying and pasting. We can copy and paste it, but this, this way we can send it in there. So we can go to the file menu and click send and click open on that notepad file that we created and tear term, paste the file right into the device. And you can watch the device configure itself in about two seconds. And once you've done that, it becomes the running configuration of the device. And you can back it up with copy run start and continue to use the device. Using this technique with TerraTerm is a great for text files, like our starting and running configuration. But what about the operating system file? There's another protocol called a Trivial File Transfer Protocol. TFTP is kind of a stripped down version of FTP doesn't require names and passwords, and you're stuck with a single directory. But what you can do with TFTP is you can also back up your text files, like your startup configuration and running configuration file, but you can also back up the entire iOS. So like on a Windows machine, you might want to back up the whole hard drive to back up all your data and the installed operating system. So to back up a particular file, we can go to a device and say copy running config TFTP. This is like the DOS copy command. Copy this to this. So this command says take whatever is in the running configuration right now, that's the RAM text entry, and copy it to the TFTP server. Press the enter key, and he's going to say, well, OK, hop, about giving me the IP address of that destination TFTP server so I can create a packet and send it to him. OK, what do you want to call that file name that I'm going to create on the TFTP server? By default, it's going to be r1-config. But you can change it to any name you want to. In this case, the user said, this is going to be the January 29 backup of the router R1. Then you type enter to confirm, and it'll write that. And since the text file is pretty short, it does it kind of lickety split in like a second. Very quick way to back. Now, you have to configure a TFTP server first. In Hyper, uh, not Hyper Demo, in Packet Tracer, you can drag a server, a rack mount server, into your topology, and you can use a TFTP server on there. And you can use a free TFTP server like uh, uh, WSFTP, not WSFTP. Uh, 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 there are many free TFTP servers. Cisco used to make one, but they withdrew it from the market because it had a flaw and had a bug in it. Oh, yeah, once you've released something on the internet, can you erase that from the internet ever again? Yeah, it's there in a million places. So you can get to it. You can find it if you need to. Now let's look at the USB ports on Cisco router. So here's a router um, that has got some USB ports built into it. Now the newer routers have got 
the regular RJ45 console port, and they also have a USB console port as well. So here's the uh, RJ45 port that you plug your baby boot rollover cable into. And here is the, it looks like a mini USB plug that you would see on an external disk drive or something. And you can plug that cable into this device. This, you, I haven't seen this on any switches, but I see it on a lot of the newer routers. So you can plug a, a, you know, a standard printer cable or a patch cable to plug in an external disk drive with into your desktop PC. If it's a Windows PC, you can load a special device driver that Cisco provides and you can communicate with that device instead of having to use a COM port. Problem is a lot of newer machines don't have the hardware built into them for the COM ports. The RS-232 port doesn't exist on most newer machines, but almost every machine's got USB ports. In addition to that, they typically have a USB port, a full-size USB port that you can plug into. Um, say you want to plug a thumb drive in and back up everything that's in the flash memory to the thumb drive. I don't have a TF2 server right now, but I sure got a thumb drive. So it's, a, uh, it's another storage uh, option that you can use. You can even boot devices with it. And we can use the directory command to view the contents of any USB drive we plug into the device. So if I wanted to back up my running configuration to a flash drive, I would plug the flash drive in. I would type show file systems to make sure it's there. In this case, our file system has been named USB flash to zero colon. And then we'd use the copy command, copy from run. It's a shorthand command for running configuration. USB flash is the designation for the USB flash. That'll copy the entire running configuration out of RAM and back it up as a text file to the USB flash drive. So he'll prompt you for the name. By default, he's going to say running dash config. You can change that to R1 config, whatever you want to change it to. And if it's already there, it's going to ask you to press confirm because you want to overwrite the older file with the newer file. We can now use the directory command and check, look on that, we just did this command and now we have a new file on that USB file, r1-config, the backup configuration for the machine we just have it plugged into. Now, if I want to restore it, I'm going to have to do the same thing I did with TerraTurn before. I'm going to have to go into a text editor like Notepad and clean up the mores and put enable and config T at the beginning and that way I can simply very quickly patch it into a device and, and recreate it. So if this device that you just saved it from went up in smoke tomorrow, well, you've got hardware maintenance with Cisco SmartNet. They send you a new router out next day, Freight Express. You plug in your new router, which doesn't have your configuration on it, but you can very easily plug in your USB drive into it and restore the proper configuration for that business function it was doing. So let's see, what's the rule? What's the number one resume? hint for people working in technology. Uh, the number three, three things you must do. Uh, have a working backup. One, have a working backup. Two, have a working backup. Three, have a working backup. Because if your devices ain't backed up and something happens, boy, you, your resume better be up to date. You're going to take the fall for that. So we all, we have lots of, we use the three, two, one backup rule. We need at least three backups of everything. Now let's talk about password recovery. Now I was originally going to give this demonstration of password recovery uh, next week, but next week we push back to the, the chapter 10 lab. I'm going to do next Thursday. This Thursday is right out because of a district faculty meeting. Uh, next Thursday uh, uh, I will do on the 29th, I will do the chapter 10 lab. And then the week after that, which is I have mapped out as an open day, I will do password recovery and I'll tape that for everybody. Have you ever had the occasion, you A plus guys, you're working with a Microsoft machine and the Microsoft and you load a, oh, let's say you get a nice new expensive $500 uh, graphics adapter. Boy, they're getting high, they're getting hard to find these days. Some of these graphics adapters have more CPU power than the actual desktop computer they're plugged into. And you put in your new graphics adapter and you load uh, the driver that they give you with it and you boot your computer up and you get the, you know, the black screen of death or you get lines across the screen. Oh my goodness, I can't get to my computer now. What can I do? Well, some of you A plus guys know about the feature that you can reboot the computer and then as it's in the process of booting up, it depends on the version of Windows that you have on it. Sometimes you press F5, sometimes you press F8 and you'll get into a sort of a disaster recovery boot menu where you can say go boot into the safe mode. 
go into the 640 by 480 video graphics mode, which will work with any device, even if he has no device driver loaded. And now your device will boot up with your fancy new $500 graphics adapter that's now running in a, you know, a $20 VGA mode. And you can fix your graphics. Uh, you can fix your device driver problem and get your machine running again. So this is a similar feature on Cisco devices that uh, if I have a router or a switch and um, I don't know the passwords, I don't, I, do, I don't either know the password to get from to log into the regular user exec mode where you can't do anything much, or I maybe even don't know the enable secret password so I can fix a problem or reconfigure a device uh, that's giving me some problems. <clears throat> So when our Windows machines booted up, we pressed F5 or we pressed F8, and we got into the disaster recovery boot menu. What we want to do on our Cisco devices is do the same thing. We don't want it to load. We don't want the Cisco device to load the startup configuration file, file with a password we don't know anymore. And maybe the last guy quit, and you're the new Cisco guy or something, and nobody wrote anything down. So what we're going to do with the device is go into the ROM memory mode of a router, and there's a technique for connecting you know, hyperterminal or TerraTerm to a device, and you've got 60 seconds. When when you turn the power onto that router or reload that router, oh, I'm not going to be able to reload it because I don't know the secret enable secret password to get to the privilege exec mode where I can type reload. So you have to turn it off and on again. Within 60 seconds of the time you turn that router back on, if you issue something called the break character, it will stop booting, and it will wait for you to go into the ROM monitor mode which is a special stripped down version of iOS that's not even powerful enough to route packets, but it's for disaster recovery reasons. You have two good reasons to have to go into the ROM monitor mode. Number one reason, we need to reset the password. No one knows what the password is for this device. Number two reason, the iOS file has gotten corrupted and we need to copy a new version of it to fix it because it won't boot up anymore. Now, since you're the authorized technician or engineer or consultant for this company, you have physical access to this router. You can only do password recovery on a router by being physically touching it up close. You cannot tell that into a router and reset the password. <clears throat> so we're going to go into the ramen mode, and then we're going to change the configuration register. Uh, there's a command called show version. We're going to show version. Normally for a router, it says 2102. It's a hexadecimal value, 0x2102. We're going to change that value to 2142, which means when that device is booting up, we're going to reboot the router, and when the device is booting up now, it will not, it will pretend the startup configuration file does not exist, and it will boot up as if it was a brand new router. And then we can go and reset, we can reset the password to something we know. We don't care what it used to be. We just want it to be something we know now. So we're going to go to copy the startup configuration. We're going to, we're going to change the configuration register, reboot the device, and the device will boot up. We'll go to the privilege exec mode. We won't be asked for any pa passwords because it's acting like a brand new erase router. Then we'll copy the startup configuration to the running configuration. We're already at the privilege exec mode. Then we can change the password to something we know, save it, reload the device, and we fix the problem of not knowing the password. So let's go into the ROM mode. We're going to initiate the break sequence during the boot up process. And um, uh, when we do that, we're going to get this command ROM and prompt, ROM, and, ROM, and ROM monitor. Madam Raman, the Cisco Psychic Help Desk Line girl, uh, is going to come up, and then we're going to be able to go through this process of, of recovering the data. So it doesn't boot up normally. It doesn't do the hashtag pound sign, pound sign, pound sign, pound sign, and start loading the iOS. Then we're going to issue that the command structure at this mini iOS can, um, ROM monitor is slightly different from the, it's completely different than the regular iOS. We want to change the config register from 2102 to 2142. So we're going to type the command config 0x2142. Press the enter key. And then we're going to type the command reset. And that's going to cause our device to reload. It's like the reload command in the privilege exec mode. So he's going to load up. And this time, he's going to ignore the startup configuration file, which has a password you don't know. Now, when we boot up again, it'll be default host name router. We're going to type the enable, no password required, and then we're going to type copy, start, run. This is reverse. Oh, you have to be very careful here. You can really hose yourself bad. You have muscle memory. Copy, run, start. 
if at this moment you type copy run start, you will type the blank default RAM configuration and wipe out your startup configuration and you probably have no backup because no one had the password. No, you're gonna type copy start run. Copy the full configuration of the device, including the passwords you don't know to the running configuration, but you're already at the privilege exec mode. You don't have to know what that old password was. You don't care what it is. You're fixing to change it to something you know. So do not allow your muscle memory to wipe out the previous configuration that nobody has. This is a resume generating event if you do this by mistake. So watch carefully what you type. Now change the password. We're at the privilege exec mode. We're gonna go to the enable secret class, whatever password we're using, using the password guidelines of that particular company. Cisco was not a good password. Class is not a strong password. Everybody that's taken the academy, all 10 million of you that have taken the academy know those passwords. So use a password with, uh, that's a little bit better than that. Then we need to change the config register back to the original one so that it will load the start of the configuration we have now repaired with the, a new password we know. So we type config register 0x2102, <clears throat> copy run start, and we fix it. Now, I forgot to mention something in this slideshow. If there are any faces, any interface ports on that router that were up and up and running, and there probably are, you need to go and type a no shutdown on them <clears throat> as well, and then do that copy running start. Otherwise, they'll be in the uh, def administratively default down and down state when they come back up again. Now, iOS management. We can use TFTP servers to back up our startup configurations, our running configurations. We can also store the iOS software images files on there. So we can centralize the management of all, make sure all our, we have 100 identical Cisco 4321 routers. They should be all running the same iOS image. So if one of them crashes, uh, the flash memory goes bad. <clears throat> We can use our centralized TFP server as a backup location to restore this. So here's good practice for using TFTP to backup. Step one, can I, do I have IP connectivity to that TFTP server? I'm gonna have to type in this IP address eventually. I'm gonna try pinging it. If you can't ping it, you can't copy TFTP to it. That's just testing connectivity. <clears throat> then let's verify the image, solid, image size in flash. Make sure we know how big that iOS file is, and is there enough room on the TFTP server? Look at the TFTP server file directory, probably a Windows machine. You've got a huge disk drive. You've got gigabytes and gigabytes of spare space you should have. <clears throat> then we can use the copy, copy flash TFTP command, you know, copy the flash uh, iOS drive. Now this is gonna take more than one second. When we backed up the running configuration, it was, you know, maybe a thousand characters or something. Very fast. Uh, these iOS images can be like 100 megabytes in size. So they'll take a few seconds when they transfer. So here's an example. I'm going to type the command copy TFTP flash. From the TFTP, uh, uh, or rather, I'm copying an image. I'm sorry. I'm copying. I'm restoring an image. I'm copying from the TFTP server a replacement um, iOS file maybe, or running configuration file to the flash memory. He's gonna ask me for the IP address of the TFTP server. Here's our IP version six address. He's gonna ask me, what's the source file name that I wanna copy from that server? And there's a iOS file for a 4200 series device. The destination file name, well, it's used to the same. I can just press enter anything in brackets is the default entry. And it'll take a little longer to do that because it's several hundred lines, several hundred million lines of code. And then it's copied that and it's been, and it's been saved. Now, there's a little bit of the boot system, dual boot stuff that we need to, look, need to know at the CCNA level. This is similar in idea to UA plus guys. Have you ever set up a desktop computer to dual boot both Windows and Linux? You can do that, you can install Windows, you can install Linux, and, and every time it boots up, you get the grub menu and you can choose it to boot into Linux or you can choose it to boot into Windows. So if I have enough space on my flash drive on my, on my 
Cisco router or switch, I can have more than one copy of the iOS stored on it, so which raises the issue, which one should it boot up? So if there's no boot system command, it'll load the first one it finds in the file system. Well, what if that's not the one you want? Maybe you want the second one. Maybe you're testing out a new bug release version and you need to go be able to roll back immediately to the old version in case there's a problem. We call that rollback and commit. Either the transaction uh, succeeds as a whole and we commit the whole transaction or we roll back to as if nothing happened in the first place. So whenever the device boots up, before he loads the iOS, he takes a quick sneak peek at the startup configuration file to see if there is a boot system command in it. He needs to do that so he can tell <clears throat> if, if there's more than one iOS image on the flash drive, which one should he boot up? Normally he boots up, you think he boots up the flash drive, he boots up the iOS and then he loads the startup configuration and starts processing data. But he needs to take an advanced sneak peek at it first so he knows which one to do in case there's more than one file system on this device. So if there is a boot system command, in this case, we've configured the boot system, configuration mode, boot system, flash, boot this iOS. And then we've got another one in that's version 15 instead of version 16. And we're checking version 16 because it's got some new features we need to test out. Once I save this configuration and tell the router to reload, tap the reload command, it'll boot using the one I specified. Okay, let's see. I think that's it for today. I'm going to, uh, hold on, I'll stop the recording.